Okay, so first I want to thank you, the, all, all the organizers, to, to, for inviting me. It's, uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to present uh, our work here. So uh, first I will take some time to introduce a little bit uh, what 3.5 Lab is, because I noticed that not everybody knows what it is. In fact, 10 years ago, uh, Alcatel Lucent, or it was Alcatel this time, and Thales decided to merge their activities around the 3.5 devices, so that they could be uh, microelectronic devices or optoelectronic devices, just in order to put in common their building blocks, their facilities. Uh, and that was even easier as uh, the two companies are working in very different uh, domains. So uh, I will present you uh, what we did uh, in terms of fabrication of photonic integrated circuits on indium phosphide for uh, meter wave uh, generation. So this work was done in collaboration with uh, Thales Air Systems, UCL, and University Calafres de Madrid in the frame of the IFOS project. And uh, this has also some impact on the new project that just started that is called IFABAC uh, NG. So first, I will make a fast introduction. So just to explain why we're making those devices. So currently, there is an increased demand in terms of uh, data rate of, uh, wireless, for wireless transmissions. And if you want to go to high uh, data rates, one thing that is necessary is to increase also the carrier frequency. And this, these very high data rates are required because, yeah, the mobile phones need more and more memory, so we need to download very heavy files even on, on, a, on, a, on a mobile phone. And so this is why we are going to, towards those very high data rates. Um, and in order to be able to get them, we proposed one option that is different from the standard microelectronic based uh, solutions, and that intends to do the generation of the, of the carrier and data relation based on optical means. So uh, indeed, what we intended to do is to integrate in the same chip a dual wavelength uh, heterodyne generator electro-optical uh, uh, electro modulators and a high-speed photodiode in order to convert the beat node into the electrical domain. Uh, and we did it uh, based on this design. So these are the chips that we've been making. So they are composed of two DFB lasers. We have some SOAs in order to amplify the signal. There is an MMI in order to couple the two wavelength, and the output of the MMI is sent to two UTC photodiodes, and before the UTC you have SOA sections in order to adapt the, 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 the optical power, and you have a, a modulation section here and here. On the same chip, uh, we have, so on this side, the electrical output, and we have also an optical output that can be used in order to control what we are getting inside the chip. So now concerning device fabrication. So it was quite a complex fabrication. Uh, so it was the layers were grown on, on semi-insulated uh, indium phosphide in order to make sure that the parasitic capacitance were low. Uh, it required three gaseous uh, MB uh, growth steps and we made active pass integration using bed joints. It required 15 masks, uh, a set of 15 masks, and uh, to, uh, other data, uh, the Bragg ratings were rating using e -beam. And at the end, this is the chip we obtained. So here we have picture, so I already described it. The chip dimension, it's 4.4 millimeter by 0.7 millimeter, so it's quite big. Uh, but it's more compact if you compare it with uh, electronic solutions. And just to describe a little bit what is inside the chip. So this is what we have in the FB sections. So with quantum wells for, in order to get the gain. And here it's the, the layer in which uh, the Bragg rating is written. And then you have the SOA and the modulation sections. That they, they use the same quantum wells we have for the DFB sections. 
and we just etch away uh, some, some, some additional layers in order to have the proper confinement. Then we have the passive waveguides. So between active and passive, we, we have a bed joint. Uh, and then we have UT UTC uh, sections with uh, above the passive waveguide, the UTC, UTC layers where you have the, the, the absorption. And in fact, uh, the, we go from the passive waveguides to the, to the UTC uh, layers through uh, uh, evanescent uh, coupling. In fact, passive waveguides and UTC layers were grown in the same uh, growth steps. So now, after all those steps, we have the device. That, this is the setup we use in order to make the measurements on our devices. So uh, we have, here is the chip, here is the, the fiber coupling in order to control what happens inside the chip. We have here a multi-DC probe in order to bias all the different sections. Here we have the data modulation input probe. And here is the multi wave output probe. So it's a 110 gigahertz uh, Coplana probe. And these are the optical spectra we obtained for different bias points of the chip. So we succeeded in order to tune the, the wavelength separation from 5 gigahertz to 110 gigahertz. So I show it this way, uh, but in fact, when we increase the bias current from one of the two DFB layers, it goes this way, uh, because the device was initially designed for high frequency generation. So the initial wavelength is, was in fact intended to be 120, and we increase the bias current of one of the two DFB lasers, and when we increase this bias current, at higher currents, you start to have additional modes uh, that are in fact attributed to the fact that uh, we have some parasitic reflections in those chips and that enhance uh, modes that are not intended to, to be lazy. Uh, and these are the tones we observe on the meter wave output. Uh, so, th yeah, there is here a gap that is just due to the measurement system. In fact, we couldn't make the measurement at 70, or we could, do, we could make it, but it, uh, the, with no guarantee of the, of the, of the power levels. Uh, so, yes, we were all able to observe, observe the tones up to at least 110. We saw it also at 120, uh, but also uh, our measurement system was not adapted, and uh, the values were not calibrated at 120. And we tried to figure out what was the photodiode bandwidth because, yeah, in, in the fabrication of those chips, the, 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 the integration of the photodiode was uh, the, the, the hard point. And uh, that was really what we wanted to do in order to differ differentiate from, from other very, very nice work done, uh, done uh, up to now. And uh, we, so we, the, the photodiode bandwidth we extracted by... Uh, um, um, correcting the values we had before from all, all the, the, the losses you have and from the, the photocurrent that was DC photo, photocurrent that was measured on the photodiode. So this is the, the response we found and we, we evaluate the bandwidth to be of uh, about uh, 80 gigahertz. Um, so we checked also about the modulation response of our modulation section. So as, as I explained before, uh, the modulation sections were made out of the same quantum wealth that I use in the DFB and in, in the SOAs. Uh, for this reason, it's, not, uh, it's quite hard to optimize it in terms of response. And in our case, in fact, the, 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 the wavelength uh, position was not optimized for the for the band gap we have from the uh, uh, at this point, and uh, that's why in fact we tried two ways of using them. We use them in SOA mode and in electroabsorption mode. If you use them in in SOA mode, uh, we have a higher response because yeah we have lower losses, 
but the, 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 the relative bandwidth, it's quite low, so not very optimized for, for high data rates. If we go towards reverse bias, we have a better, a better bandwidth, uh, but the, we have a lot of absorption in the, in the EAM. So that's why for the experiments I will present here, we chose, in fact, to, 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 to find a to bias them at this point in an SOA mode. And these are the back-to-back -back measurements we made. Uh, the nice thing is that you can ma make the measurements directly on the chip. Uh, you have the photodiet and you have, the, you have the, the modulator. You don't need any optical coupling to make this measurement. So when this is the di eye diagram you obtain at 4 gigabit per second. So with the bandwidth, we have we could expect a little bit more, but okay, it's not that bad. So now, considering wireless transmission experiments, so this is the, the setup we've been setting. So with a chip that is biased, we, 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 the, the biased with the different bias supplies, uh, we have a bias T, so to bias the for the diet, and we we. Put uh, on the modulation section uh, the signal from PRBS uh, generator. We have a very short uh, horn uh, wireless transmission, and at the output we we make uh, heterodyne uh, detection with the local oscillator. And by using this setup, uh, these are the eye diagrams we obtain at 100 megabyte per second. So the, 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 the eye diagram is quite open at 100 megabit per second. Uh, we could go, in fact, uh, yes, and the carrier that was used for this transmission was 90 gigahertz. And we could go up to 200 mega, megabit per second, but in fact not at high uh, data rates. And this is mainly uh, because, in fact, we were affected by jitter inside the, our chip. Uh, uh, and this jitter is even more affecting the transmission as we are using heterodyne uh, detection. Uh, some partners inside the project made some measurements with, uh, with uh, direct detection with the Schottky diet, and uh, they are really less affected by, by this jitter, and they were able to make a transmission at up to two, uh, gigabyte per two gigabit per second. So now I will conclude and, and show you some prospects. So yeah, we've been successfully integrating DFB lasers, SOAs, passive waveguides, and MMI couplers, and UTC for the detectors in order to make this, this uh, miniature wave transceiver. This was used in order to perform generation of uh, a carrier from 5 to 110 gigahertz. Uh, and we demonstrated 200 megabit per second uh, transmission over a short distance. But for sure, uh, this is not enough. Uh, in order to have something that is really interesting for the application, we would need to go at, I would say, 10 gigabit per second. So what we expect to do is, yeah, for sure, to try to improve our chip because we know the, 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 the problems we have in it and how to solve them. But also, we would like, with the chip we have, to increase the distance. Because, uh, up to now, it's two millimeters, so it's really short. Uh, we, we would like to make transmission up to 10, 10 meters at least. And also, uh, we aim to do some, uh, some beat note stabilization using uh, PLL, PLLs. And also, in future devices, we think about increasing the carry frequency because we showed in previous work that we are able to have 170 gigahertz UTC diet. So, thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and the speaker. Yeah, we, we do have time for a couple of questions from the audience. Um, let me start with the, was a short one for my curiosity. Uh, the, the limitation of the intermediate frequency, what are the plans to span that? How are you going to, if you can reveal a little bit, how would you plan to span the, say, to go to 10 gigahertz bandwidth and, and further? You, you, mean, you mean the, the limitation of the f concerning the data rate? Right. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if we, 
we know that when, when you look at the response we get, it's not that bad. When you, you're working in an EAM mode, for example, you see that the bandwidth is large enough in order to cope for, for 10 gigabit per second. So what we have to do is just to reduce the losses of the EAMs. So if we have the appropriate wavelength on, on the DFB side, then we should be able to reduce a lot of those losses and even also to improve the, the efficiency of the modulators. So I think this is really the way to, to improve the performances of those devices on this point. Yes? Do you know approximately if your, the responsivity of the photo detectors and how much output power, electric uh, output power you're aiming for? So uh, the responsivity of those detectors, it's of 0.3 uh, mm -hmm. uh, amp per watt. Uh, it's not optimized because, yeah, when you make these kinds of integrated devices, you have to make some compromises. Uh, we were able to handle quite high photocurrents, uh, up to 10 milliamp with those photo detectors. And the nice thing is that as you have all those optical amplifiers, you can very easily adjust the power you launch inside them. So when I'm speaking about tell me amp, it's tell me amp when the, the device is, 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 is working, is behaving as, as we want. Yes, a, a question over there. Yes, can you explain the behavior at about 6 gigahertz in the transmission? Oh, I think this is mainly... I, I think it's related to parasitic elements in the in the in the circuit, so I um, would not. I don't think it's due to something inside the chip. I am curious about one and then, okay. So about the integration of the photodiode and the antennas. Mm. For instance, the pitch you can get uh, of the two photodiodes. Uh, what would be the needed and what would be the, the limitation if you want to have a kind of multiple input, multiple output kind of systems already from the chip using the photodiode? Uh, in fact, uh, there are no, you, you can put them quite close to one another and you can separate them quite easily. Uh, so these kind of devices are quite well adapted to integrate antennas. We already we have some devices with antennas, but up to now we didn't have time to to test them. So yes, uh, it's just that if you want to 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 to, to not to, to to lose too much space, it's better to go then to high frequencies to have more more reduced size uh, antennas. Okay, let's end the speaker.